presentation today because this effort of doing roof line analysis and insight compute, which I'll talk to you about for the next hour and a half or so, is largely uh, the result of a co-design effort between DOE and NVIDIA, specifically a request from LBL, uh, and, and in particular, um, Sam and Charlene, who are helping do the session today, really pushed for us to do this, uh, add this functionality to NSEC Compute. And so I'm happy to report that as of the um, CUDA 11 release of NSEC Compute, which is version 2020.1, we are now able to do refine analysis in NSEC Compute. Um, before I talk about that, I want to give you a brief overview of uh, NVIDIA's developer tools for profiling to give you a sense of the landscape of what tools we use now and uh, how roofline analysis might fit into that. So um, the set of profiling tools that NVIDIA provides uh, go under the, the Insight product family name. Uh, in particular, we're going to focus on Insight systems and Insight compute. I'll, I'll emphasize that these are not the only developer tools that NVIDIA provides. Uh, there are also, for example, debugging tools like uh, CUDA GDB, which is a CUDA extension of GDB and can be used for debugging uh, applications that run on NVIDIA GPUs, as well as CUDA memcheck and the new compute sanitizer, which are vaguely analogous to what you might use Valgrind for uh, for a CPU application. Um, and we also work closely with the uh, third party tools ecosystem, so tools like you know, HPC Toolkit, Total View, that sort of thing, uh, Vampire and Score P, uh, know how to talk to NVIDIA GPUs and are supported on our platform. So um, the Insight product family is, uh, looks like this. Typically you would start with Insight systems to get a comprehensive application level view of, your, of what happened when you ran your code. So it, it's collecting information on both the CPU and the GPU and it's really telling you things about when and where you had GPU workload in your system and when and where you had CPU workload in your system. So you always start here whenever you're running an application for the first time on a GPU. Uh, and even later on, you typically always use inside systems to get a high level view of what's going on in your code. Um, it tells you uh, when your kernels are running. So kernels are just the, the name for the discrete units of work that happen on the GPU, uh, regardless of which programming language you use. And uh, inside systems helps identify where those are. And generally speaking, uh, you use this to get a, a high level view of the performance of your application and understand, am I using the GPU effectively at all? And you can only be using the GPU effectively at all if the bulk of your runtime, in some sense, is spent on the GPU. So if you have a GPU accelerated application and only 5% of the runtime is happening on the GPU, uh, this suggests that you're probably not using an uh, accelerated GPU compute node effectively. So inside systems should really be used to answer that question first, namely, what percentage of the time am I actually spending on a GPU, right? And you really want to maximize that or, or at least get that pretty substantial so that you, you know that you're using your GPU effectively. Only then, uh, when you have determined that a particular kernel or set of kernels is uh, dominating the runtime of your application, should you then attempt to optimize those kernels. So th this talk is mostly going to focus on that process of diving into a particular kernel and then analyzing its performance. But I just wanted to start by emphasizing that in some sense, this is not the first step of the process typically, because in most cases, your workload will be more complex and it's not just a single kernel uh, that dominates the runtime. And you want to get to that place, but you may not start there. Uh, and so um, in this workflow, then you typically start with inside systems, identify a particular kernel or set of kernels, and then analyze those kernels with insight compute. If you are a user now of uh, NVProf and its user interface, uh, NVIDIA Visual Profiler or NVVP, we're generally encouraging you to switch to these new tools, NSI Systems and NSI Compute. Um, NVProf and NVVP are in maintenance mode, so we are fixing bugs as we find them, but we are not adding new features. All new profiling development um, is going into these new NSI Systems and NSI Compute tools. And in particular, these will be the only way to profile on Promutter, and so it's definitely worth your time to learn how to use these tools. Uh, as I said, NSI Systems allows you to collect a high-level application timeline, and then NSI Compute is used for uh, profiling specific uh, CUDA kernels and getting uh, very detailed performance information on those. Uh, it's pretty simple to collect a profile with NSI Systems at the command line, and I will give you an example of this um, uh, in my walkthrough. You just do NSYS profile, uh, and then the name of your application. And if you add dash dash stats equals true, that gives you a summary output to standard out, uh, which summarizes a list of kernels that ran as well as uh, other operations that occurred. So that's that's pretty similar to what you would have gotten if you had used nvprof at the command line, with no arguments. Um, 
So I'm going to use just the command line interface today uh, because the sample codes that we're, we're going to be working with are very simple and only have one or a few kernels. So jumping into the UI won't tell us much more than we can see from the command line output. Uh, but for a real production science workload, you typically want to use uh, the NSAID systems UI to understand where the kernels are in your application. And this is an example of what that might look like if you did that. Uh, we have on the top part a view of what's happening from the CPU side. So uh, the workload on the CPU threads, as well as calls into the CUDA runtime API. And the CUDA runtime API is, is, is called into typically regardless of your programming model. So whether you use OpenMP offload or OpenACC or a high level approach like Cocos or Raja or Thrust, typically those are calling into the CUDA runtime API to actually launch work on the GPU. And in the bottom half of the uh, plot, you see information about the kernels that ran on the GPU as well as uh, memory operations as well. Uh, the kernels listed here are blue and the um, uh, memory operations are listed in red here. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right into Hensight Compute, which is our kernel profiling tool um, and tell you a little bit about how it works. So uh, NSIC Compute is designed to give you different views into um, different aspects of the performance of your application. And it's presented in the form of several sections, each of which tells you something about uh, the performance of your application and a particular, a particular kernel from that application. So uh, if the first section, which is always the one you typically start out with, is the GPU speed of light section, which tells you information about uh, what percentage of peak you're getting uh, for both compute, which is this upper bar, and then memory bandwidth, which is this lower bar. I'll go through what these mean in more detail in my uh, hands-on exercises. Uh, but then we have several sections that follow. Um, one of the sections will be this roofline analysis section that I will show you during my demo. Um, but we also have other sections like uh, compute workload analysis, memory workload analysis, that sort of thing. And again, I'll walk through this UI um, in detail in my, uh, extra, in my walkthrough. So I'm not expecting you to understand all of this now. I just want to give you a sense of what you're, what you're getting. Uh, and Site Compute has both a user inter like a GUI um, interface as well as a command line interface and it's pretty customizable. And in fact, one of the things we'll see today is that you can customize it pretty strongly to do the analysis that you want to do. So one, one example that I will talk about is that you can actually create your own roofline chart. So if you wanted to add some roofline analysis that we don't provide for you, it's actually fairly straightforward to do. Uh, the, the main challenge is understanding what hardware counters you would need in order to uh, provide the information you're looking for. Uh, Insight Compute has a workload analysis section that allows you to uh, memory workload analysis section rather that allows you to see the flow of memory traffic through both the um, physical uh, memory spaces so like l1 cache l2 cache and device memory as well as logical memory spaces like global and local memory uh, as part of its one of its sections um, it also has other things like compute uh, and instruction workload analysis which we'll take a look at um, and so compute does have the capability to create what's called a baseline to compare multiple versions of a uh, kernel. So for example, you uh, profile a kernel and then you make some tweak to it and you want to see, did my tweak make the performance better? You would then load that uh, report in and then create a baseline for the original version and then get two bars so you can see both the, the um, current one and the baseline. Uh, and that would tell you whether your performance got better or worse. You can also, of course, do that um, with multiple invocations of the same kernel in the same application in case you want to check whether the performance of that kernel varies as a function of time in your application. And so if you can also allow you to uh, do correlation between the assembly instructions and your lines of source. So the way the NSIC compute typically works is that under the hood is that it's collecting samples of hardware counters, uh, each of the instruction um, uh, in your assembly code. And then it's collecting information about different things that are happening at that uh, particular assembly instruction, like how much time was spent there, um, how many uh, floating point operations, how many memory operations are occurring at each instruction. And you can, uh, if you want to correlate that back to the source code that you actually wrote, whether it be in C or in Fortran uh, or some other language, uh, as long as the compiler that you use can generate that information, you can then see where, both where the time is being spent in your application, as well as how many samples for each of these individual pieces of information were collected there. <clears throat> Um, one thing that I'll emphasize, though, is that uh, it can be pretty tricky to use this correctly. Uh, the fact that uh, a number, like a particular line of code has the most samples associated with it doesn't necessarily mean kind of naively that that's the most expensive line in your application. Uh, it, understanding that really under, 
entails getting a, a more thorough understanding of the, the fact that GPUs are running many instructions simultaneously. And so it, it can be, one must interpret this with caution and, and practice it requires some experience to interpret it correctly. Um, and so compute, uh, as I said, has both a user interface and a command line interface. Um, you can use both to drive your application. Um, I'm going to only today use the command line interface to drive the application. And then when I want to uh, load it into the user interface, I can just save it to a file that NSA Compute knows how to interrogate and demonstrate the results from that. But you can also just print some results to standard out if you want to. And this is an example of what that might look like. And it has many of the same fields. So like the speed of light metrics, which give you a percent of peak, uh, are the same numbers that you would see in, those, in that bar chart that I showed before. Uh, if you want to profile the kernel with Inside Compute, you just use the uh, command line interface name NCU. That's the user interface script that does the profiling. Uh, the name of this was a little bit different in previous versions of Inside Compute. It was nv-nsight-cu-cli, which is both a mouthful and also hard to type. So we hopefully shortened it and made that a little bit nicer for you. Uh, and this is available as of the most recent release of Inside Compute 2020.1, which is available on Cori. Uh, so you just do NCU in the name of your application. If you do that with no arguments, what that does is it profiles every <coughs> um, kernel in your application. And because the, the nature of GPUs, we cannot collect an arbitrary number of hardware counters um, at every uh, invocation of a kernel. Uh, so if you want to get a relatively detailed view of the application, uh, NSIC Compute needs to rerun your kernel multiple times in order to understand its performance by collecting all the counters you asked for under, uh, implicitly. Uh, that can make your application take a very long time, uh, potentially orders of magnitude longer than it would be when it's not being profiled. So it's typically recommended to narrow down your search a little bit in production applications by specifying either the particular kernel name that you're looking for, so that's with the dash k command, or by profiling only a certain uh, subset of the invocations, uh, for example, only profiling one or a few invocations of the kernel and then leaving the rest unprofiled. There's another command line option to do that as well, which I can talk about. Uh, but uh, as I said, you can also use the UI for driving the, the application. I won't do that today, mostly because uh, on a typical HPC cluster environment, it typically makes more sense to um, drive the application with the command line interface, save the file, and then uh, view it offline and use your interface. But if you were developing on your local workstation, you could use the UI for that. Okay, so that was my overview to um, Insight Compute as a general tool. Uh, any questions before I jump into some hands-on exercises? Uh, there's a question in, in the Slack. Um, do we need Insight that comes with CUDA 11? Um, basically, uh, the answer is yes. If you use the, so that, uh, let me say this: the version of Insight Compute that you use uh, to collect the data should be consistent with the version of Insight Compute that you use um, to view the data. It's possible if you have a version mismatch that you will that it will still work. In particular, it usually works for a newer version of the UI to uh, load an older version of the report but it often does not work the reverse way. Um, so that might be uh, something to consider. Um, we can um, potentially sort out uh, your installation issues for particular OS, but uh, if you're using the UI, it's probably recommended to use the, the version of NSIC Compute 2020.1, uh, which is the version we're gonna collect with today. Um, I will also note in response to the specific question that you do not need to install the NVIDIA driver to, um, or even the CUDA toolkit as a whole to install NSIC Compute. NSIC Compute is available as a um, standalone installer. So if you um, just Google for uh, NSIC Compute, um, and I can give you an example of the uh, installer page um, here, you can see if you click to this download button, it'll take you uh, to a download portal in, in the NVIDIA developer zone, which can allow you to just download NSIC Compute as a standalone tool rather than having to download the entire CUDA toolkit. And that will be a new, new enough version to support the analysis that we're doing today. Um, and I'll also point out that this requires an NVIDIA developer's own login, so you will need to create an account to, to go through this route. But it won't, hopefully it won't take that long. And the next question in chat was how to use NSIC Compute offline. Um, that's basically what I'm going to show you today, is, is collecting the data um, using the command line interface and then loading it offline into the user interface. That's the way I'm going to use NSIC Compute today. Okay, so I'm gonna jump right in to um, some examples. 
Now, what I'm gonna do is encourage you to actually walk through these with me. If you want, you can just watch, but I think that you will gain a lot more from this exercise if you attempt to do it yourself. Uh, and so for that reason, I will go through this relatively slowly so that you have the opportunity to follow along if you want to. The first thing that you should do is clone uh, the roofline on NVIDIA GPUs repository. So this is the uh, repository that Charlene was showing earlier. It's on GitLab and I will just copy it in the uh, Zoom chat. And if somebody could uh, copy that into the Slack chat as well, that'd be appreciated. Um, so you'll wanna go ahead and git clone this repo. So um, I'll give an example of that. I can just uh, do git clone and then that um, git repo. And I'm gonna recommend that you clone it to NERSC because NERSC is where we're going to actually be collecting the data. So I'm gonna go ahead and do what I just recommended to git clone this repository. This will take a little bit of time to clone because the example code that we're gonna use has um, a relatively large input file. We're gonna fix that in the future, but for now uh, it's kind of a large download. So I apologize for that. You see it takes a few seconds. So you can see I'm doing this actually on NERSC. I already happen to have uh, an instance uh, GPU on the core GPU nodes. And if you do, if I do S run dash N1, NVIDIA SMI, you can see that I have a single GPU available to me. If you look at my module environment, you'll see that I have this set of modules uh, loaded and I'm gonna recommend that you match up something approximately like this, which you can get uh, by doing module load and then GCC, PGI and CUDA uh, 11.0.167. Uh, note that this CUDA is not the default um, CUDA module. Uh, this is one version newer than the default, which is 10.2.89. So go ahead and just do module load uh, CUDA.11.0.167 explicitly so that you get that. Um, there is also an NSIGHT compute module, uh, which is kind of decoupled from the CUDA toolkit. I'm not gonna go through that today, but the NSIGHT-compute module always has the latest version of NSIGHT compute. Um, it just happens to be that right now these two are the same thing. Uh, but NSIGHT Compute does release more frequently than the CUDA Toolkit. And so you, if you want the latest and greatest, you can always load that module explicitly. Okay, so if I uh, CD into my uh, application uh, repo, uh, it, you'll see several files uh, that should match the ones that we see um, on the uh, repo page. So what you'll see is a gpp.f90 file. Um, that's the actual application source code that we're gonna look at today. Um, there's also a uh, ancillary file which loads the input data and kind of sets up all the arrays that we're gonna work with. Um, and there is, uh, this is the actual input data file which is that large thing that I was talking about. There's also a readme which um, goes through uh, a description of what's actually in this. I'm gonna walk through this with you so you don't have to read all of it now, but if you wanna to refer to this offline, you can just look at this relatively detailed readme to understand what's going on with the files that we provided here. In particular, these scripts that are being used for collecting profiling data. There's also a make file, um, which is used uh, for compiling the code I'm gonna work with today. Um, so if I inspect the make file, you'll see that I'm using um, PGI to compile OpenACC code. So this is Fortran code and we're using OpenACC uh, as the um, parallelism model. This uh, for the main exercise that I'm gonna go through in a little bit. Um, one of the nice things about using Insight systems and Insight compute is that they're pretty agnostic to the programming model. So um, anything that is capable of generating uh, NVIDIA CUDA code under the hood, which is basically what this is doing, uh, can be used with Insight compute. And so um, that's totally sufficient for what we're gonna need today. Uh, and not, so I guess a corollary of that is that none of the, the principles I'm going to talk about are specific to OpenACC, and I'm mostly going to ignore OpenACC uh, as a language when I look at NSIGHT Compute, but I am going to focus on, NSIGHT, on OpenACC as I talk about the um, optimization of this particular model, just because it, uh, we do need to think a little bit about the parallelism in order to think effectively about how to use GPUs. Okay, so... Um, what I'm gonna do is CD into the tutorial directory for a second. And this is the set of files that we're really gonna work with today. Um, and if I uh, LS it, um, you can see it's taking me a long time to do this. I think that's either it's because the query file system is being a mess or it's because my um, script, which 
does some good things under the hood as part of my batch profile is taking a long time. I'm not sure which it is. Uh, so what I've done is I've created a readme uh, that describes the tutorial that we're going to work with today. Um, and I will explain what these files are. But we can also just look at the readme in our browser. So if you go to this tutorial directory and then look at the readme, um, I'm going to talk about, this talks about what we're going to do today. So I'm going to actually go through this live. But if you get lost um, or you want to refer to this later, the readme helps kind of describe in words the exercises that I'm going to go through today. So the first thing that we're going to do is look at a very simple tutorial code. Before we get to this more complex GPP uh, science example that we prepared for today, I'm going to go through some very simple um, CUDA C kernels, which help uh, both give us some practice actually using NSIGHT Compute to collect uh, data, and then understanding whether the roofline analysis and the other parts of the profile that we collect jive with our intuition about how these individual uh, kernels should work. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this file. Um, in my text editor. And what I'm going to look at is three kernels um, that are part of uh, this sim simple CUDA C application. And I will do that as soon as the core file system is acting in my favor. Okay. So we have three kernels here, which we've named kernel A, kernel B, and kernel C. Uh, kernel A is, um, let's take a, look, a little bit of time to think about what this does. And if you've never seen CUDA C before, um, don't worry about it. Uh, hopefully you can see that this is actually not that scary. What kernel A does, if we just look at this, this main part of the work here, which is the, um, the actual thing we're gonna focus on, Kernel A takes a simple array, 1D array that we're calling A. This is a, an array of doubles. And just um, creates a, a simple local variable D, which is the result of adding up a particular element in A 100 times. Uh, or we'll, um, uh, we're at, rather, we're unrolling it 100 times. And the amount of times we add is determined by this parameter M, which in this um, particular application we're handing as 10,000. And so we're going to add the same number 10,000 times to this local variable D and then um, store the result of that back into that same array index. This is obviously an extremely contrived example. You would never do anything like this in a real science application. Um, but the reason I've chosen this example is that it, um, there's a lot of compute work here, right? And so if we think about um, the plot that, that Sam showed earlier, where you're in both the bandwidth band regime and the compute band regime, this should probably be in the compute band regime because we're doing a lot of floating point operations for a relatively small amount of work. So I'm going to pose a question. If M is equal to 10,000, what is the arithmetic intensity of this kernel? Take a second to think about it just by reading what we're doing. And then if you think you know, you can post it in the Zoom chat. So I'm looking for a specific number here, which you can compute. Okay, yeah, that's, that's pretty much right. So basically what we're doing here is we are doing 10,000 double precision floating point operations. And approximately speaking, we're just doing a single load and a single store, right? Um, now, how many bytes are there in a double precision word? There's eight, that's exactly right. So you could estimate the um, arithmetic intensity of this kernel approximately as, um, 10,000 over eight. Now, uh, somebody else in the chat pointed out that this may um, be affected by the cache line size, right? Because in reality, we um, are not just loading a single uh, eight byte word of A, we're in fact loading um, a full cache line typically. 
Now, the reason that that is um, not so relevant for this is really dependent on the way that NVIDIA GPUs work because each thread uh, in our CUDA kernel is, is accessing a different location in A. So this is something that's CUDA specific. Um, so this index means that we're getting a unique index of our thread in the CUDA grid and then loading, and then each thread is operating on one element of A. And so even though it's true that um, multiple threads or any one thread is only operating on one element of A rather than the full cache line, it's also true that um, multiple threads are accessing that same cache line at the same time. And so um, from, a, from the perspective of how we typically would analyze uh, this piece of code, typically we would, we would use that definition of arithmetic intensity of 10,000 over eight or 1250. Um, but um, what we'll see is that um, in fact, that could be affected by the cache. Um, but it turns out actually that the arithmetic density is in fact uh, 1250. But it's, it's good that you're already kind of understanding that the cache effects could affect that. But typically what we do in roof line analysis is we separate that out, right? So we just focus on the number of bytes moved from DRAM in order to do this. And because it happens to be the case that uh, for this application, we are gonna be loading every uh, element of A and coalesce loads, uh, we don't have to pay for that cost. Whereas if only a single thread were to execute this um, loop on only one element of A, then yes, that would be a relevant factor. Kernel B is actually identical to A, and I'll explain what the difference is between kernel B and kernel A in a second. Um, and then kernel C is a little bit different. So kernel C has a strided memory access. Um, so A at some location, determined by our unique thread index in the grid, is equal to B at some other strided index plus B. So this is just a single double precision add. The strided index is given by this formula. And rather than try to parse what this math does, basically the way to think about it is that the threads in warp zero access the location at A of zero, A of stride, A of two times stride, et cetera. And because we're choosing a stride of 16, uh, that means that warp zero, the threads in warp zero are accessing memory locations 32 bytes apart. Um, warp one is then accessing the next locations. So thread zero and warp one accesses A of one, uh, thread one accesses A of stride plus one, et cetera. And so the end result is that every location in A does access, get access exactly once and the same thing is true for B. But if for any particular thread, the element it's storing in A is equal to a different offset in B and any particular warp is accessing uh, very um, dis disjoint uh, locations in memory. This is pretty much uh, one of the worst access patterns you can have um, from the perspective of a coalesce loads for particular warp. Um, and uh, the question was, am I assuming 32 threads per block? I'm actually using 64 threads per block uh, in this example. Um, I just used warps uh, here for simplicity. Um, the, the, the most important point is that every warp is accessing locations that are uh, stride locations away from each other. And so the question to answer here is, um, or one question to think about is, what is the performance of this kernel? So uh, I mentioned that from a perspective of coalesce loads from DRAM, this is actually pretty bad. So you could attempt to compute what the um, kind of in your head, and if you want to take a guess in chat, uh, what the performance of this will be, um, what kind of DRAM bandwidth we'll get from this kernel, you could attempt to do that. Um, so go ahead and think about that if you want to. Now, um, for these three kernels, uh, we are creating arrays that are of length um, 80 by 2048 by 100. I've chosen this number because 80 by 2048 is the total number of threads that can be simultaneously resident on a single V100 GPU. And V100 is the GPU that we're going to use today on the Cori GPU nodes. And I have scaled that by 100 just so that there's sufficient work to do. Um, and again, these are double precision numbers. And you can see I've just created with CUDA uh, arrays A and B of that length. I've just set them to zero, defining my threads per block, and I'm watching kernel A, kernel B, and then kernel C. Um, and I mentioned that in code, kernel A and kernel B are identical, um, but um, the difference between how I'm launching them is that with kernel B, I am loading, uh, I'm setting the shared memory uh, for each um, thread block to be equal to 96 kilobytes. This happens to be the maximum amount of shared memory that you can request on a Volta V100 GPU, as long as you uh, set this attribute for the function appropriately. 
And so essentially what this does is it ensures that only one thread block can be simultaneously resident on a particular SM rather than the maximum, which is 32. And so that will have effects on the occupancy of our GPU because um, GPUs uh, work by hiding latency by having many threads simultaneously resident at once. And so when one thread issues memory load, uh, we can then uh, sh shuffle it off to the side and let another thread come in and do some work. If we don't have that many threads simultaneously resident on the GPU, it's hard to hide that latency. And so we should uh, expect the performance of this kernel to be different. Okay, so with that overview of the code, let's go ahead and compile it and run it. So if you are, uh, if you have the CUDA module loaded, um, which is just CUDA 11.0.167, you can just compile it with, um, you know, your standard MVCC command. If you've used CUDA before, this is how it looks. Um, the .cu extension is just convention for CUDA, but it doesn't have to be that way. There's a flag you can use if you want to use, just name it .cup, for example. You'll see I now have a, a tutorial executable, and I can go ahead and run it um, on my uh, GPU. I don't have any output because I haven't done like any error checking or diagnostics, but I can go ahead and use NSYNC compute the command line to uh, profile this kernel. This will make it take quite a long time because now we're, you see that we're running each kernel 19 times in order to collect the requisite statistics for the information that we requested. And then the output lists each kernel one by one, and then it gives you some summary output. And so it gives you this GPU speed of light section, which gives you some summary output about how effectively we're using the GPU. Um, and then the same is true for, <coughs> for kernel B and then kernel C. Now, um, that only collects a relatively limited set of information. You can use the dash dash set full command to collect uh, pretty much the full set of statistics that uh, NSYC Compute is capable of collecting. And um, now each one will have to be run 75 times because we're now collecting more data, which requires more hardware and software counters to be collected. So you can see this will actually make the um, application take even longer to run. And so this quickly becomes a chore if you have a real science application. And so it's important to profile only the kernels that you're interested in. And then finally, what we can do is store the output of this to a file. So I'm going to do ncu-o tutorial. And what that does is it stores the output of this to a particular file, which will have the file name tutorial.ncu-rep. So the file extension gets automatically added. I just have to give it the, the name of the file. So this will take about the same amount of time to do. And then what you'll see at the end of this is that um, I don't get any summary output to standard out. I just get the fact that this report file was created. And if I inspect my local directory now, you'll see I have this tutorial.ncu-rep file. Now, what I'm going to do is copy that file down from my uh, system on Cori, from the, from the Cori system to my local uh, computer where I'm running, where I'm logging in. And so if I look at my directory, um, you see that I'm in this directory. This is just my home directory, Roofline and Video GPUs tutorial. Um, so what I'm going to do is in a separate terminal window, I'm going to copy from Cori uh, this file, tutorial.ncu-rep, down to my local system. So you can see I've done, I've done that SCP process. And so this is the workflow I'm going to use today uh, because I would prefer not to try to drive the GUI from remotely from the system. Uh, as I think Charlene pointed out, it's possible to do this using either like X forwarding or no machine uh, if you have to, but I strongly encourage you to download the user interface on your local laptop uh, and then try it. But if you didn't get a chance to do that ahead of time and you don't want to do it now, you could if you wanted to run it from like through some sort of X forwarding or, or VNC forwarding using the name of the command line interface, which is NCU dash UI. Um, so again, I'm not going to do that today. And in fact, I don't think I even have the right X forwarding set up. Well, I guess I do have the right X forwarding set up. Um, but it looks like it crashed. So I haven't bothered to try to debug that. But if you can get that working, that's one way to run the user interface. Instead, I'm just going to load the user interface uh, from my local system. Um, and it looks like this when you open it, you get um, this pop up box, which, uh, if you had any recent files open, would show you this. I'm just going to X out of this box. And I'm going to manually locate the file that is downloaded on my system. I'm going to go to File and then Open File. Um, I'm not going to use Open Project, that's slightly different. I'm, I'm looking for a particular .ncu-rep file that I previously downloaded. I'm going to go to File and then Open File, and then just locate that on my system. So you, it was called tutorial.ncu-rep. I'm going to go ahead and open it. So the way that NSYC Compute works is that it has um, 
every invocation of the kernel as a separate launch in this launch page. And so you can see I've launched kernel A, kernel B, and kernel C exactly once. Um, we start with kernel A because that happened to be the first one that we launched in the application. And what we're going to look at is this first, the first thing you see is this GPU speed of light section. And the GPU speed of light section tells you um, what percentage of both peak compute and peak memory bandwidth we achieved for this particular kernel. So the, the, it goes from 0% to 100%. And if your bar is at 100%, this means you are effectively using 100% of your compute subsystem effectively, and you are then bottlenecked by that, right? You can't get it better than 100%. This is just the limits of the machine. And then a similar thing would be true for memory. If you had 100% of memory bandwidth, that would tell you you're limited by just the, the pure hardware memory bandwidth of the system. So if I highlight over this, you can see I get a 99.81% um, SM. So SM stands for streaming multiprocessor. That's just the name for the fundamental compute units on the GPU. So this means I'm using the compute units of the GPU um, basically at 100%, right? I could not get any better than this um, from the perspective of compute utilization. Um, I would not, I could not, as a mean, meaning I could not do floating point operations any faster than I'm currently doing them. You can also see that that number is up here, 99.81. Okay, if I scroll down a little bit, you can see that I have um, the roofline chart. So that's the next thing that's happening here. And um, the roofline chart tells you um, what uh, the arithmetic intensity is. And so the actual dot on the graph is corresponds to the, um, the arithmetic intensity. If you highlight over it, you see both the arithmetic intensity as well as the performance in flops. Um, and so this is about 3.35 uh, teraflops per second. Um, the vertical axis is this number of flops and the horizontal axis is the arithmetic intensity. So if I hover over this, um, you can see that the arithmetic intensity is uh, 632.52. How does that compare to the number that we were looking be at before? Well, if we refer back to our kernel, what we see is that we're doing both a load and a store. So when we said 1250 before, we were only accounting for one of these two operations. The true arithmetic intensity accounts for the fact that we're loading eight bytes and then storing eight bytes. Um, and so really the number is 10,000 over uh, 16, which is about that, um, 625. So we're getting approximately the right answer, approximately what we would expect, uh, 10,000 over 16. Um, now, the, this is intended to look exactly like the plots that Sam was showing before. This diagonal line here is the memory bandwidth bound part of the um, system. So that's for arithmetic intensities below about 10. And then the square is located at the machine balance point that Sam was talking about. So this is exactly where um, memory bandwidth and compute are balanced and happens to be at an arithmetic intensity of about 7.5 for double precision and about double that for floating point, uh, single precision, which is listed as floating point here. And so the memory bandwidth is the same because memory bandwidth is memory bandwidth, um, uh, bytes are bytes. But from the perspective of the compute bound part of it, there's actually different roofs for both the double precision, which is this lower bar the single precision, which is upper bar. And that reflects the fact that the peak compute performance of NVIDIA GPUs is actually not the same for both single precision and double precision. There are about twice as many um, single precision uh, floating point units on a GPU as there are uh, single double precision. And so the peak double precision performance is about half of that of single precision. So we can see that in fact, our um, kernel is exactly where we'd expect. It's way over here in the compute bound regime, has the right arithmetic intensity, and is relatively close, at least in logarithmic uh, terms, to um, the uh, double precision roof. Now, if we look at the actual value here, we can see that's about 3.35 teraflops per second. And if I hover over the double precision roof line, we can see that the peak, um, the peak is actually listed here as uh, 6.7 teraflops. And so you can see we got exactly half of the peak. So what's going on here? We said that we're using our compute units at 100%, yet we only got half of the peak performance. Well, the reason relates to what Sam was talking about earlier, that when we count flops, um, the flops depend, the, how we count flops depend on the operations that are occurring. So this does a double precision add, which is one flop in the way we typically count flops. But the GPU in that, you can do a single double precision add in a single clock cycle. 
but we can also do a single, a, do, a double precision floating fuse multiply add in a single clock cycle, which is the equivalent of two flops. And so the only way to get this advertised sticker number of like seven teraflops per second on a V100 in double precision is to be doing FMAs or fuse multiply adds. Note that it's the same number of instructions, right? Whether it's a double, a double precision add instruction or double precision FMA instruction, uh, but the number of flops that is, is associated with that is different, right? There's a factor of two difference. That is a relevant thing to consider when you're counting flops. If we were doing an instruction-based group line like the one that Sam mentioned, um, th this might, might give you a different view, right? It's basically saying that we're limited by the instruction throughput of the double precision pipeline. And that would be true whether we were doing double precision ads or double precision FMAs. If I were then to scroll down to the instruction statistics, I could then see that of the instruction mix of different um, instructions that were loaded by this, uh, run by this kernel, almost all of them were dAd, which is just double precision add. All right, let's take a look at kernel B. Uh, so kernel B um, has the same arithmetic intensity because it's the same code, but notice that its performance is much lower than that of kernel A, right? So on the vertical axis, uh, it's very far away from the roof line and its peak performance is only um, 827 gigaflops. So it's like a factor of um, six or something like that below the, uh, the, what we got before. And if we look at our speed of light section above here, it's telling us basically the same information that we were getting only about a quarter of our peak performance compared to the 100% that we saw before. Uh, so in kernel A, um, we got 100% and then kernel B, we got only about 25% of peak throughput. Um, I mentioned in my talk that you can use the baseline feature. So I'm gonna go ahead and click add baseline, which makes kernel A, which is the high performing one, the baseline, and then we go ahead and switch to kernel B. And so you can see the, the sharp disparity in between the new um, one and the baseline, which is now colored in green. So the new one is blue, uh, this is the current, and then the, um, the new one is green, this is the baseline. We can then plot these two both on our roof line chart and see that the, um, the baseline one, again, does have much higher performance than the new one, the kernel B. The color of the ring here represents uh, which one of these two things it's referencing. So the outer ring of this data point is green, so that corresponds to the baseline. And the outer ring of this data point is blue, so that corresponds to the current one, the one we're looking at now. Um, if I were to scroll down here um, and look at the occupancy section, what I would see is that the theoretical occupancy of this kernel is only about 3%. And that's because, as I mentioned before, uh, NVIDIA GPUs can have as many as 32 thread blocks simultaneously resonant on them. But we've artificially limited the number of thread blocks that can be resonant on, this, uh, on an SM by using shared memory of uh, 96 kilobytes. And so that means that only one block can be simultaneously resonant on that GPU. Whereas if we go ahead and look at kernel A, um, the occupants, the theoretical occupancy is 100% because uh, we are not using any shared memory for that kernel. And so uh, there, are, there is no limit on uh, resources or there's no contention for the shared memory resources in this kernel. So essentially our theoretical performance, our occupancy went down by a factor of 32, which is a large factor in why our performance went down by this factor of four or whatever it was. Now the fact that it didn't go by, down by a factor of 32 is something worth thinking about. Um, I can kind of give some hints about that, but I'd encourage you to think about that first. I'm gonna go ahead and add one more baseline so that now um, this kernel B is the baseline and go ahead and switch to kernel C. Kernel C, if I look at the roof line, is way over here in the bandwidth bound part of the regime. Uh, you can see its arithmetic intensity is 0 0.06. If you look at the code, this is exactly what we'd expect because we are loading. So here, how do we count flops? Well, we're doing a single double precision add, right? B plus B. So that's one double precision uh, floating point operation. And then we are loading B once and then storing uh, A once. And so we're doing, we're loading, we're, we're loading eight bytes and then we're storing eight bytes for a total of 16 bytes moved. Uh, and we're doing a single floating point, um, single floating point operation. So my error by intensity is just one over 16 or 0 0.0625. Note that the compiler will optimize out this, right? It's not actually gonna load B twice. It's gonna load B once into a register and then just add that register to itself to do this floating point add. So we're only loading B at this index once. Note though, very, something very interesting is that it's very close to the bandwidth bound part of the roof line. Whereas I said that from the perspective of 
memory accesses, this is one of the worst patterns you can have because every warp is only accessing one element of the potential thir um, 32 that it could have been loading at one time in a coalesced load. And the reason that you still get a pretty high effective DRAM bandwidth, this is just the DRAM loop line here, right? right? We're not talking about L1 or L2 cache at this point, is um, the fact that we're getting a lot of L2 cache utilization uh, from this um, kernel. And so if we look at the memory workload analysis, we can see that our L2 cache has a hit rate of uh, 90%. So this means that the cache is very effectively saving us, saving our performance in this application. And the way that that works out in practice is that um, the, um, if you look at this code, right, if warp zero loads uh, the cache line corresponding to this element, then if warp one comes along later, this element is already gonna be in cache, um, this element one. And a similar thing is gonna be true for all of these other um, locations as well, that these will all have been loaded into cache as well. And so in this particular application, Now, one thing that we have done uh, for this application is, um, or rather, I should say, one thing that we've done at the NERSC installation is that we have created hierarchical roofline charts that show L1 and L2 cache. And so if I were to look at um, the L1 and L2 cache, um, I now have rooflines for both L2 and L1 cache as well. So this kind of is representative of what um, Sam was showing before. And so um, if I look at my, DRAM value here, um, I can see this, this is the 0 0.06. Um, and if I look at my L1 achieved value, for example, um, it's 0 0.02. But the, act, the L2 value is actually pretty much right on top of the DRAM value. You can't even distinguish them in this case, um, which is a pretty um, good example of um, uh, what we were talking about before of how, um, I'm sorry, it's actually right below the L1, I should say, rather than the DRAM. Um, pretty good example of how for many applications, um, whether or not L1 and L2 and DRAM are spread out uh, really affects um, your interpretation of the performance of the application. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop talking about this toy example now. One thing that I will say is that I pretty much stole um, these examples from a wonderful talk that I'd encourage you to um, listen to, which is um, at, was, was presented at GCC 2019 from last year. Um, so it's this talk that was given by um, some folks or engineers on our developers tools team, Sanjeev Satur and Magnus Stringer. In fact, I saw Magnus, I think in the participants list earlier, I don't know if he's still paying attention, um, but he gave a wonderful talk on these three kernels, which really helps understand the way that um, multi-threaded applications work on GPUs and in particular understanding how warps get partitioned on SMs. And so if you wanna get a really detailed view of how uh, these kernels play out from a, a performance perspective, I'd encourage you to go ahead and uh, check that out, uh, that talk out. And I've included the link to that at the bottom of my slides. Uh, so uh, if you download my slides um, later on, you can go ahead and get the link to that. Okay, so hopefully that demonstrates um, how we use the roofline analysis tool and how it looks for both um, compute bound kernels and memory bandwidth bound kernels. I'm gonna go ahead and switch over now to the um, so the GPP exercise, uh, which is a more realistic science case. And so what I'm gonna do is look at this gpp.f90 code. Um, I won't, so this code um, is really a single kernel that we're gonna look at. And one thing I'll say is that um, I'm not gonna talk at all about the science case that repre this represents, right? This actually comes from the Berkeley code called Berkeley GW, which is a material science application. And, um, this actually does have, this particular kernel is pretty much lifted directly out of that code, but I'm not gonna talk about what it does, right? Because what I'm gonna emphasize is that as computer scientists, we can analyze a particular piece of code without even understanding at all what it does or what kind of, what it represents. And in fact, sometimes understanding the, the science of it can be a detriment to our understanding of the, the code uh, because it kind of gives us preconceived notions about what it's supposed to do. So I'm just gonna show you some code and we're gonna think about um, how the code works without really understanding what the science is behind it. But uh, the readme for this, um, uh, for this repo does uh, give some links 
to some talks that Charlene and Sam and others have given in the past, which kind of give more detail about this application and what the motivation is for this. So the single kernel that we're going to look at is this code that's right here. Um, this is a single OpenACC um, loop. And so it's a triply nested, it actually, uh, there's four nested loops in between each other. So there's these three loops and then a uh, final loop here. So this is just four do loops in Fortran. And the only thing that this application does really, the only work that it does is this single um, triply nested loop with this little bit in the middle that does, that is of length three. So I've given in a comment here, the, length, the, the trip count of each loop. Um, this loop just has a trip count of three, um, but the trip count of these outer loops is like a thousand each and then 10,000 for this loop here. So that's really all this code does, right? If I scroll down to the end, the only thing that's at the end here is that it just checks whether the output is correct. And a lot of the boilerplate code that um, initializes the data that we're going to look at is all off in this GPP data.f90 file. And so if you really want to understand the data structures, you would come here. It's a mix of one dimensional and two dimensional arrays. And we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But this, this initialized data routine basically does the work of loading in this dot dat file, which is the actual data for this, and then allocating and storing the data in all the arrays. I don't want to focus on that today. I just want to, again, be computer scientists, look at some code, and understand the performance implications of that code. So what this code does is um, it has these three outer loops, which are loops over some elements. And again, I'm not even going to talk about what the meaning of these are. I'm just going to treat these as, as code elements, right? So we have a loop over this NT band dist, over NGP own, and over N cools. And then these are the loop ind uh, indexes, indices, N1 loc, IGP, and IG. And then IW is this inner loop, which is just has this trip count of three. If I look at what this code does, is it, co it computes some values like W tilde, W tilde two, et cetera. Um, it has some conditional code uh, here and here. And then what it does is it stores its result as a sum reduction to these values, SSX array and SCH array. And now in the original code that this came from, these were intended to be actual arrays like of length three, but OpenACC does not support array reduction, at least in the 2.7 standard that we're gonna work with today. So um, for this code, we have explicitly broken up the reduction into these three components manually, right? So you have the uh, underscore one component, underscore two and underscore three. And so we're reducing, uh, we're doing a sum reduction over six variables, um, which are just uh, three, three components each of two arrays. If you've never seen OpenACC before, that's totally okay. I mean, this works exactly like you might expect if you used, for example, OpenACC. Um, it, the re sum reduction means the same thing. Um, the concept of present just means that this data is already on the GPU. Um, loop and gang, uh, gang vector tell you something about the, how the parallelism is mapped to the GPU. Uh, which I won't focus on today. We're just going to basically treat this as a fully collapsed loop. And that's really mostly what we're going to focus on today, where we just flatten out these three into a single loop of length, you know, like 1,000 times 1,000 times 10,000. So we have a fairly large amount of work to do, which is good because GPUs are only effective if you can have a relatively large number of degrees of freedom to work with. Um, so it needs to be typically like a million or more. And this uh, satisfies that requirement. One thing to note is that these um, kernels use double, um, complex double precision arithmetic. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that, but uh, just be aware that when you see something like conjugate, this is referring to the complex conjugate, which in Fortran is an intrinsic that you can work with. OK, um, just take a brief pause. Any questions on either this code or people getting stuck downloading the code or, or anything like that? Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Um, so uh, in the chat, somebody asked, is there a C or C plus version of this code? The answer is yes, but we don't have it in the repo right now. I think that's one of the things we wanna do in the future is have a C version of this code. And in fact, in the actual Berkeley GW code uh, that this comes from, this kernel has now been converted to C plus um, plus. So it shouldn't be too hard for us to create a C plus plus version of the code. But, but we, haven't, we just haven't gotten to that yet for this um, tutorial repo. Okay, so if we uh, just compile, as long as you have the PGI model module loaded, you'll be able to compile this code. The make file has the right flags for you. And what you'll get is this gpp.x um, executable. If I run that, 
Uh, what this does is it does two things. It actually loads the data, it then runs this kernel. It reports the time it took to run the kernel, that, that triply nested loop that we saw. And it also has some diagnostic output that tells you whether you got the results correct or not, um, which is useful for uh, if you make some change, you want to make sure that you didn't get the answer wrong when you did that. So having that validation is important. Now, um, what I'm going to use uh, to help me collect the data is I'm going to, I created a simple tutorial script, which is in the tutorial directory. So you see, if I look at the tutorial directory, I have this profile.sh script. And if I look at that, it's um, really just collecting, it's just doing ncu and then dash dash set full and then dot gpp.x. I have some logistics in here, which are kind of specific to the NERSC install and that help us get our custom hierarchical roofline analysis. So this hierarchical roofline that I showed you, um, this like double precision hierarchical roofline chart is not shipping as part of the default part of the tool, but we created this as a custom uh, report um, section for NSA compute in this tutorial repo. Uh, and so we're just kind of giving it to you. And then maybe later on in like later versions of NSA compute, we'll look at uh, installing these as kind of the default um, set of uh, report files that you can collect. But for now, for this part of the repo, we, we've done this for you. Um, and yes, we can, generally speaking, use newer versions of the tool to run code compiled with older, older versions of CUDA. So I think PGI is compiling with CUDA 10.1, as you can see here, but we're using NSEC compute from uh, 11.0, and that does work. So what I'm gonna do is um, run my profile um, script. I have to run it through SRUN so that I can run on the GPU. And it takes as a single argument just the, um, the name of the profile to make it simple. So I'm gonna name my profile baseline. And um, what that will do is create a baseline.ncu rep, which is the baseline version of this code. Now, unfortunately, this is gonna take uh, quite a bit of time to do, because remember, we have to profile this code 75, we have to run that kernel 75 times in order to collect the statistics. So whereas it only took like 1.8 seconds to run um, when we were not profiling, it's gonna take like a minute or two to profile um, when we, uh, to collect the profile. <clears throat> so let's take, I'll just give people a second to catch their thoughts, catch their breath while I collect that baseline. The question in the chat was, does NSA Compute work with um, libraries that use CUDA aware MPI? So there's a kind of a couple things to break down there. One is that uh, both Insight Systems and Insight Compute are not um, really designed for large scale parallel profiling. So you can use them to profile individual MPI ranks and then just create an individual report file for MP every MPI rank. Um, and then for Insight Systems, it is possible in some cases to profile all of the MPI ranks on a single node if you're running Insight Systems from the same node where the MPI ranks are running, uh, but it does not extend to um, multiple nodes yet. Um, now, the second part of the question was about CUDA, where MPI. That's a subtlety that I won't really get into, but generally speaking, yes, there shouldn't be any additional complexity added from the fact that um, the GPU buffers around the GPU, because that really is kind of orthogonal to NSA compute, which is just analyzing your kernels. It will just kind of ignore the MPI bits. Um, now, while I wait for this to finish, I just wanted to say a couple more words about this um, kernel. And so um, we saw that we were doing a three dimension, a, a triply collapsed loop of our three um, loop nests, which have uh, meaningful work to do. And so that's a, and, and we've chosen that as the baseline code because basically that's what you would do as a naive, you know, as kind of your na naive first attempt at profiling this application. You generally would follow the paradigm of, I want to expose as much parallelism as possible on the GPU, right? GPUs are hungry for work. Um, exposing as much parallelism as you can is a pretty good rule of thumb. So generally speaking, when you um, port a code from CPUs to GPUs for the first time, it's a pretty good idea to um, just expose as much parallelism as, as possible. And so we have taken that approach. We've uh, flattened out this loop nest so that there's, you know, um, tens of millions of elements of work to do. And then uh, that uh, helps us ensure that the GPU is uh, saturated at all times. And what we'll see um, is that that's not necessarily the most effective way to go about it. Um, and we'll talk about why, uh, but I just want to emphasize that we chose that as the baseline code because it is, it is kind of what you'd expect to write as your first attempt at parallelizing this code. 
um, I'm going to go ahead and open up another window. Um, so while I collect that data, I can talk more about this code. It's actually taking longer than I expected. I hope Corey's not hanging on me. Um, so um, if we take a look at this code, um, we might think about this question of, um, is there anything we can do differently? So one thing to note here is that because the trip count of these outer loops is both 1,000, the trip count of this inner loop is 10,000, if you take the product of the trip count of any two of these loops, it already has approximately enough work to saturate the GPU, right? Even if you just parallelize these outer two loops here, you have about a million elements of, of work worth to do. And that's typically enough to come close to saturate, saturating a GPU in many cases. And so we could think about whether we want to parallelize only two of these kernels instead of uh, two of these loops rather, and leave the third one unparallelized. Now, the reason we might want to do that is that if we look at this loop body, what we see is that there's some work to do. Um, but what we're going to find um, is when we look at the, the profile, um, we might have a question about whether uh, if this is, so the first question to answer really is, is this a memory bandwidth bound code or a compute bound code? And I think that if you look at this code and stare at, stare at it long enough, you will not be able to figure that out, right? This is a relatively complex bit of code. It uses complex arithmetic. It has, you know, division operations. It has many loads. It has this exponent operation. It has an absolute value of um, a complex number, which is not a simple, not a trivial thing. Um, and then it has these reduction operations. And so I think that it's relatively hard to understand just by inspecting the code, whether this is bandwidth bound or compute bound. And so the first thing that we're gonna do is look at our um, profile and try to understand that. Um, sorry, this is taking much longer than I expected to collect this um, profile. I'm gonna give it like 30 more seconds to see if it finishes, but maybe it's hanging or something like that. Oh, there we go. See, patience is a virtue. It just took 317 seconds to the profile. So that obviously is a long time and we'll probably wanna make it shorter going forward by not collecting all the statistics as an example. So I got this baseline.ncu rep file here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do the same process of copying that down to my local system. I'm going to SCP from Corey, um, same location, reflect on video.gpus, but this is called baseline.nce rep. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open inside compute. I'm going to um, clear all my baselines. I'm going to close out this old tutorial report file and go ahead and open uh, my new file, which is called baseline.ncu-rep. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the roofline chart. And interestingly enough, if we look at the double precision math, the double precision math has an arithmetic intensity of 7.36, which is almost exactly lined up with the machine balance point of 7.5 for um, double precision math on a V100 GPU. So this tells us that we're right in the cusp of being between bandwidth bound and compute bound. There's also a second point on this curve here. You can see that this is the single precision number. It turns out that the compiler is generating some single precision um, instructions, even though there aren't any explicitly in the code. But this is, so, you know, the performance of this thing is completely irrelevant, right? Almost all of the work is happening in this. You can see that this is, you know, over two teraflops a second, whereas this is, you know, 50 gigaflops a second. So we can ignore this single precision math and just focus on the double precision math. And so because this is right on the cusp of the memory bandwidth to compute bound part of the, the, the regime, what we might think about is that if we want to make some optimizations to this kernel, a logical step might be try to move it over to the compute bound part of the regime fully, right? So if we're like over here somewhere, that's a good place to be because then we can just focus on optimizing the compute um, parts of it and, and be sure that if we made the, and be confident that if we did make enough compute optimizations that we could hopefully get up to this roof line, right? So the goal is to get up to the roof line. And the way that we can do that is by having some room to breathe by being in the compute bound part of the regime, i.e. by increasing our arithmetic intensity. It's always the dream of an HPC programmer to be in this compute bound part of the regime, because then you have a chance of using the, the full, you know, advertised seven teraflops a second sticker performance of the GPU. Um, it's not always easy to get there. In fact, it's often very hard to get there for many HPC codes. Um, but our goal will be like a logical first step might be, let's try to move over to this compute bound part of the regime so that we have room to breathe and get up to this roof line. So uh, what we can do then is change the code to help do that. So if I look back at the code, 
Um, what I'm going to do is take note of what I was talking about earlier about how I can choose artificially to only collapse two of the loops rather than three of the loops. And if I do this, then um, what that means is that one of the three loops will be executed serially by every thread. So now I'm injecting 1,000 or 10,000 elements worth of work depending on which of these three loops I choose to run sequentially in each thread. So I could do something like this. And what this would do is it would enforce that each of these three, um, each, these two loops are, are parallelized among threads, but the, both of these two inner loops are then run sequentially by each thread. So that there's more work to do. Whether this brings us to the compute bound regime or not really depends on kind of the balance between floating point like memory operations and compute operations inside the kernel. But generally speaking, giving more work per thread gives us a pretty reasonable chance of increasing the arithmetic intensity of that thread. So now let's ask the question, which of these three loops should we put inside? We have some choice here, right? We do not necessarily have to keep the ordering that we've listed here. So let's expose, let's look at um, which of these three um, ones to do by looking at the memory access patterns of each of these uh, arrays in this kernel. So there's 2D arrays and 1D arrays. Most of these are 3D arrays. So if you look at these arrays like W tilde array, I eps array, um, Here's another IEPS array. Here's AQSM temp local, AQSN temp. What you see is that most commonly, IG is the innermost loop index. And in Fortran, the innermost loop index is the fastest moving one because it's column major. And by the rules of good performance on NVIDIA GPUs, we generally want sequential threads to be accessing sequential locations in this fastest moving index. So because IG occurs very commonly as the first loop index, that means that typically, it's going to be best for, for performance, we can guess, if this is uh, sequential among threads. Similarly, IGP um, is, at least for one of these loops here, uh, the innermost loop index. Um, and then N1loc here, which is our third loop index, is always the outermost index for any of the arrays that we're accessing. So a pretty good guess would be, for our performance, that um, we generally want to ensure that array accesses to um, IG and IGP are coalesced as much as possible. And for N1loc, that's the least important because N1loc is always strided, right? For almost all of these arrays, N1loc is strided, meaning that um, sequential threads could never possibly access sequential locations of N1loc because it's always the um, outermost index. And so sequential locations in this are never uh, uh, contiguous in memory. So the, pretty, the best thing that we could probably do here is actually to choose N1loc to be our innermost loop index, like so, and then parallelize um, over um, IGP and IG. So that's the, what I'm going to choose to do. And um, this makes sense because when we collapse a loop, um, IGP and IG will be flattened out. But the flattening that the compiler does is, um, is, is kind of same in what you'd expect, right? So like uh, when we flatten it out, um, sequential locations in IG are still sequential in threads. And so for all of these arrays that have IG as the first index, you will have, you will remain with coalesced access. Uh, Hugo points out that um, N1loc is coalesced in one of these arrays, uh, OCC array, and that's true, right? But what we're, what we're kind of looking at is just the balance of arrays, um, array um, accesses in this kernel. We see that the, most of the arrays, um, all of the multidimensional arrays of N1loc is the outer index. And we can hope, or we can guess maybe, or at least we can experiment with the idea that that will offset um, this. So it's worth an experiment. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and compile it now with this change, and then go ahead and run it and see if that helps. So um, what you can see is actually that that um, really did not change the performance at all, right? It was about 1.8 seconds before, and it's about 1.8 seconds now. So that's interesting. Um, by the way, if you didn't follow what I did um, in the code, I have a set of git patches in a tutorial directory. Um, and so those git patches basically are the automated way to apply what I just did. And so um, it just basically describes that. And in fact, if you were to do uh, git checkout and then git apply um, tutorial step one dot patch, um, you would see that what has happened is I've made that same change to my kernel. And that's exactly the change that I just made, where I made IGP and IG the outer collapsed loops, and I made the N1 loop be, uh, loop be sequential. So finally, uh, the next thing we can do is profile this code. 
um, to understand, even though the code didn't get faster, did it achieve the thing that we wanted it to achieve of making uh, the arithmetic intensity of this kernel increase? That was the goal we had to begin with, right? It wasn't necessarily to get faster. It was just to give us room to breathe so that we could then apply some optimizations. I'm gonna go ahead and for the um, sake of not making it take forever to um, profile the code, um, instead of doing set full, I'm just gonna do set um, detailed, um, which will give us um, a slightly smaller set of information, but which will um, still collect our roofline um, plot that we were looking at. So I can do s run tutorial profile.sh, and I'm gonna call this step one, it's my profile name. So again, this will take um, like a minute or two to collect the data. That's just an, an inevitable consequence of the length of the time it takes to um, collect this. Um, so we'll just be patient and wait, and I can take uh, any questions people have while we're waiting for that. <clears throat> right, so the idea from the question in chat is that um, we're trying to do two things with this change. First, we're trying to increase the arithmetic intensity, right? That's really the, the actual thing we're trying to achieve. We're trying to give each thread more work to do, which is one way of, of hoping that we can get a higher amount of arithmetic intensity because we might have more flops per byte move. Given that we've chosen to do this, then we're trying to choose which of these three loops um, to do that operation on. And we're choosing n1 loc as the least harmful loop to do it on because in, the, in all of the two dimensional arrays that we looked at, N1 loop was the outermost loop, so it is not sequential locations in memory. Um, and we're hoping, uh, as an experiment, that that will um, offset any of the other cases like that OCC array where it, it is sequential in memory. So there is no like golden bullet here, right? There's nothing we can do that would um, unilaterally make the performance of the kernel um, better without any trade-off, right? There's always a trade-off, but our guess is that N1 loc is the least harmful loop to put in this innermost loop because of those array pattern accesses. Um, is it possible to use NSA compute with containerized applications? Uh, generally, yes, although there's a little bit of subtlety. Um, we can talk about that like during the break or offline later. Uh, but for example, if you download the CUDA um, containers like on Docker Hub, uh, those ship, um, they either ship with NSA compute or you can easily install NSA compute like we just with apt-get, and then you can use NSA compute within the container. And then kind of a follow-up question, why is the innermost loop gonna be the worst one? Um, well, I don't know for sure. I'm just kind of hypothesizing that the reason why n1 loc is the, um, the one we wanna use and not ig is that for most of the two-dimensional arrays, ig is the innermost loop index. And so the general rule of thumb for NVIDIA GPUs or really any GPUs is that sequential threads should be accessing sequential locations in memory. And we're paralyzing these loops over threads. And so uh, we want to ensure that sequential threads, which are the sequential locations, or sequential ind indices in this loop, are accessing sequential locations in these arrays. And uh, n1 loc is for most commonly the one that is not coalesced, uh, that is not contiguous in memory as access to these arrays. So it's probably the one that we can um, do sequentially within threads rather than paralyzed among threads. Uh, so you can see this is still taking a little bit of time. Um, this is just the kind of the reality of doing this kind of performance analysis on realistic applications. I apologize for that, but um, hopefully it won't take too much longer. Okay, so. We've uh, collected our profile. You see it's step one, that NCE rep. I'm gonna go ahead and download that to my um, um, laptop or to my desktop. Um, while I do that, because of how long it takes to profile, I'm actually gonna go ahead and um, apply the change, the next change that I'm gonna do now. Um, um, and then I'll let it collect that data. And then uh, as it's doing that, I will, um, uh, explain um, why, we, like what this change was and why we're doing it. Uh, and I need to not do that. Call it step two. 
okay, so while I collect step two, and I'll explain what step two is in a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and look at step one. Let's go ahead and file open, and then uh, look for step one.nc rep. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, first go to my baseline and, uh, code and click add baseline so we can see what our performance uh, comparison is. And then look at um, what uh, the, the new uh, code looks like. And so the orange is the baseline. So that's this uh, dot here for double precision, which was right around the machine balance point. And this is my new code. And then what I see is that I now have an arithmetic intensity of about 20. So my hypothesis has worked out. Um, and in fact, I was able to increase the arithmetic intensity by a factor of about three, which is great because now I can just focus on optimizing these um, uh, parts of the, the compute workload and hope that when I do that, I just move upward um, and it can get close to that um, roof line point. Now, um, I kind of presented it to you as I knew what I was doing, but in reality, um, this is an experimental process, right? So this is something that both the Berkeley GW folks and I have looked at for quite a lot of time to kind of figure out which is the right set of steps to do, um, but we didn't know that a priori, right? So we kind of had to experiment and um, you could do this kind of analysis that I was doing just by looking at the code um, if you're experienced enough at GPU programming, but sometimes you might just wanna experiment and try different things and then see how they affect the arithmetic intensity. And if you had done one of these other experiments that I mentioned, uh, you might've seen that it would have gone a different way and then maybe that would be, be an indication that it was the, kind of the wrong direction to go in. Now, um, if you look at the um, actual utilization, you see that in fact it decreased a little bit, right? So my um, SM and memory bandwidth percentage actually are a little bit lower than the baseline in both cases. Um, but that's okay, right? Because we don't, this is not gonna be our final step. We're just trying to get the arithmetic intensity increased. So then now we can focus on optimizing these um, uh, parts of the kernel and then um, um, go from there. So uh, this is just giving us some breathing room for the optimizations that are gonna follow. <clears throat> okay. So it uh, looks like I'm almost done collecting my data, um, but I'll, let me go ahead and explain what the change is now uh, for step two. If I can find my code. Okay, so um, this is the baseline code. And then what we did was we um, collapsed two loops instead of three, and then we moved this N1 loop in the middle. And then, so that's one change we made. The next change we're gonna make is focusing on these inner bits of loop. So what we've done here is we have a single loop with trip count of three. And what we basically have done, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that we have manually unrolled this loop here. So we've, for each of the three um, SSX array and SCH array, what I've done, what we've done in the code, is manually unrolled this reduction, right? Because OpenAC doesn't have the concept of array reductions. So we had to uh, manually uh, reduce on each of these six elements of those two arrays. And one might hypothesize that both the branchiness of this bit of code and the fact that we are now doing three reductions in a single um, kernel might affect the performance of this application, right? We might hypothesize that it would be better to simplify this logic so that um, the reduction is simplified. And one way that we could do that to remove the branchiness of this is actually, as kind of a, a trick, which you might not have realized, is that we could, in principle, move this loop outside of the um, actual OpenAC region, right? So nothing is saying that we have to have this loop inside the code, and in fact, could be moved outside. And so I'm gonna go ahead and show you what this looks like after we make that transformation. What we do is we move this IW loop outside the OpenACC region, and um, the rest looks like we had before, where you have IGP and IG as a two-dimensional collapse loop, and then N1 loop as our innermost loop, which is sequential. And the nice thing about this code now is that we can just um, produce over two values instead of six. So SXX array, SCH array, which are just single complex double precision values. And then this um, branchiness here just gets replaced by a single set of values, um, SSH array and SCH array. And then after each of these three invocations of the parallel loop, we just add the, the respective value to each of the locations in the actual arrays that we want to do the reduction over, right? So this is kind of just a hack um, reflecting the fact that 
um, OPC doesn't have this array reduction. But in fact, we might have wanted to do this anyway to reduce the richness of the code and reduce the amount of this code that is related to reductions so we can just focus on doing as much compute as possible. So um, if I were to go ahead and run that code, does that make the performance any faster? It appears that the answer is in fact yes. We've decreased the time from 1.8 seconds to 1.45 seconds. And while we were looking at step one, I collected the profile for step two. So I now have this step two.nc rep. Let's go ahead and download that profile and look at um, what that did. So I'm gonna go ahead and add this step one as a baseline. So now we have two baselines, um, which we could rename if we want. So we could call baseline three equal to be our actual baseline code. Um, and then this red one would actually be what we're calling step one. I'm gonna go ahead and open up my step two. All right, so let's look at the roof line chart now. And our current point is now here. So this was our baseline code, this was step one, and then this is step two. So now what you see is a couple of things. One is that if you look at the point, it's actually a little bit higher, right? So we've achieved a little bit higher performance. Um, it's hard to see maybe on the scale, but it is, an, it is higher vertically. If you, if you hover over the point, you can see that this was 2.5 teraflops, whereas this one uh, was 2.0 teraflops. So this was a you know 25% increase in, in performance. That's, that's definitely non-trivial. Another thing to notice is that our arithmetic intensity actually decreased again. So we had an arithmetic intensity of 20 before, now we have an arithmetic intensity of 10. And so this is interesting, right? Our goal was to just move this point vertically upward. And we did move it vertically upward, but we also moved it to the left, right? And I think that this is really an inevitable consequence of doing roofline analysis in real applications. It is very hard to just move the point vertically upward uh, because real code doesn't work that way, right? Real code does not bend to our wishes of just kind of following a uh, real set of trends. GPUs are complicated, compilers are complicated, and so, it's definitely possible to move the performance upward, but not necessarily without keeping, without changing the arithmetic intensity. So what we've seen is that we increase the performance. We are still in the bandwidth or the compute bound part of the regime, but um, we, um, this is one reason why it was important to give us that breathing room, right? The fact that we moved way over to the right on this compute bound part of the regime meant that we had some breathing room so that we can make a change, which in some sense decreases the amount of flops that are occurring in the uh, loop because we've removed some of the work, right? We made a, a streamlined simpler kernel. But we also made it a more efficient kernel. And so if we go then and, and look at our um, utilization, we now see a story where we have a much higher SM compute utilization than the baseline code, right? And so this is pretty nice because what this is telling us is that even though we had a little bit less work to do, the efficiency of our work, we're getting a better efficient use of the compute units on the GPU. And so um, it's uh, that, that kind of correlates with the fact that our total performance went up. So uh, we decreased from you know, 1.8 seconds to 1.4 seconds. Now, if you look at the, um, the time, notice that, that it's actually a little bit different because we're actually launching three kernels now, right? Um, because this, cor this correlates to the fact that we are now um, launching this kernel multiple times. And so the, the time for an individual kernel is different, um, but that, uh, the overall runtime is um, more than a third lower per kernel. And so we've kind of compensated for that. And yes, um, definitely one of the things that we want to do uh, in a future version of Unsight like Compute is make it easier to either make this a linear axis or like zoom in or something like that, because in fact, it is hard to see that difference. So that is a noted pain point, and we'll definitely hope to improve that in future versions of Unsight like Compute. And kind of a useful add on point to that is that we definitely want your feedback on this. This is a new feature and then so compute 2020.1 with Qt 11. Uh, this is not the final version of the tool. Um, we're definitely gonna improve this based on user feedback. We've already gotten some great feedback from NERSC before, and um, we hope to get more feedback from, from the users on this call. So that's definitely one of the things we wanna get out of today is for you to go ahead and try this out in your own code and give us feedback both on, is this useful to you as an, as, as an analysis tool, and what can we improve uh, in the data collection uh, to make this better? Okay, so I just have five minutes left. I'm just gonna talk about what the rest of the exercises would be. I'm not gonna go through them in detail. I'm gonna leave them up to you uh, if you wanna do them later on. 
And then I'll close with some parting, some parting thoughts. And so um, if we look at our code now from the end of step two, um, there's a couple different things that we can do here to improve the performance of this uh, code. <clears throat> One of them is that the um, double precision um, divides are um, challenging because as Sam mentioned earlier in his talk, a division operation does not map to a single hardware instruction, right? Division operations are actually a sequence of instructions which implements some algorithm to do a floating point division. And so in double precision um, or in single precision, uh, but especially double precision uh, on NVIDIA GPUs, a division is not necessarily an efficient operation. This does not map to a hardware instruction. However, there is a hardware instruction for computing the reciprocal of a double precision number. And so in many codes that use floating point math, <coughs> it is um, beneficial to compute the reciprocal of a number first. So we can compute some temporary um, variable like this. Um, like that's one thing you could do, right? Uh, that would what you would be doing for a uh, simple real um, uh, floating point number. It's a little bit different for um, complex numbers, but it follows the same principle, right? We're gonna compute the reciprocal of a number first um, and then um, um, uh, multiply by that. Now, somebody asked a very logical question in the chat. Why doesn't the compiler do this optimization for you? Well, the answer is sometimes it can, but one reason why it may not is that um, that will change the result to um, at least to the round off, um, the truncation error of your um, floating point precision. And compilers don't always um, make those optimizations, which may change the answers to that uh, precision. It will definitely depend on the optimization level of your compiler. Um, so that is one thing to consider um, when you're writing code is that at least in many compilers and many architectures, um, this is doing the reciprocal and then multiplying by the reciprocal is a faster operation than doing a floating point division. This is not specific to NVIDIA GPUs. There are many architectures where that's true. Um, and um, the other thing that you could do as an optimization to this kernel is to look at the fact that this, to, to look at some of these complex math operations and then find ways to do them that are less um, compute intensive. And so for example, um, the absolute value of a complex number is not just, you know, taking the sign bit and setting, you know, making it positive. It's actually a more involved operation uh, for the absolute magnitude. And so um, you could find a way to de change the amount of work, make it more efficient by only looking at like the squared value of the value of the, um, of this IEPS array and then uh, compare it to uh, just compare the absolute value here by taking away this app. So if we take away the apps here and the apps here, we can still do the same comparison uh, if we want to, but with less work. And so if you look at in the tutorial, the readme, um, step three and step four are the ones that I'm looking at. And they basically describe what I want you to do for this complex math uh, and division operations. Um, and so those are some things that you could look at. And I have provided for you um, a step three and step four dot patch, um, which help, uh, which actually describe what I'm doing in case you kind of get lost on, on that operation. Okay, um, I'm just about running out of time. The last thing I want to say before I close is that um, um, you can customize NCI Compute to do your own roofline analysis. And so if you look at our NCU-sections directory, um, we have actually created for you some of these custom sections files that do hierarchical roofline analysis. And so, um, for example, uh, if we look at the hierarchical double roofline chart section, this is an actual section file that we created. It's just a simple text file in JSON format. Um, I won't go through detail because of time constraints, like how the, the format of this file works. But if you were to analyze this text file, you could kind of get a sense of what it's doing and then make changes on what the metrics that you're collecting are and then create your own roofline analysis. And so when we were showing before these like double precision roofline charts, these are actually things that we created on our own and then just added to our installation. And so that's one of the nice things you can do with um, NSI Compute um, is you can add your own section files. And so one thing you can try is creating your own custom section file. And if you find that it's really useful, you can send it to us as feedback and we can consider adding it to a new version of the tool in the future. Or you can get, for example, your local um, HPC center to install it in their installation of NSI Compute. And so in fact, if you look at the installation of NSI Compute, um, at NERSC, um, I'm not in the right window. 
uh, and you look at the CUDA um, installation of NSEC Compute um, in uh, CUDA 11, which is here, um, you look at the sections directory, you can see that in fact, NERSC has installed um, these section files that we created for this tutorial there. So you can actually take advantage of those directly in this installation if you want to. Otherwise, you could just download NSEC Compute on your own and then copy the section file in there and then use it um, just the way that I've shown in my profile script. Okay, so um, that was my kind of one hour and a half introduction to NSEC Compute roofline analysis on both the tutorial example and the GPP example. Um, later today, you can either apply NSEC Compute on your own code or you can do the steps three and four that I've shown off in the GPP exercise if you want to kind of dive deeper. Any questions before we break for lunch? I think there's one about uh, whether unsafe math optimizations will be used in the, I think, step three optimization. optimization. Um, well, NVCC is not the compiler we're using for this. Um, I think it is true that NVCC can do that optimization. Um, I'm not, I don't remember off the top of my head what, what, how it works for double precision. And in particular, we made double precision um, divides much more efficient in CUDA 11 compared to CUDA 10, which is what we're using now. So this operation may in fact be um, le a lot less necessary in CUDA 11. I haven't checked that yet. Right, I think there's a flag for fast math or something in. Yeah, I just don't know whether this is part of that uh, set of operations of fast math. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, other than that, I think all the questions are covered. Um, so uh, it's a great tutorial. Thanks, Max. Um, I guess we'll break for lunch and be back at a quarter, quarter past quarter past one. Um, so feel free to post your questions or um, you know issues on Slack or on the Google Doc. Uh, I'll be monitoring all those places and. Um, I'll see you guys in about an hour. Thanks.